Okay. Right, Sam. All right. Welcome, everybody, to my final presentation. My name is Sam Ma. And before I get started, I'd like, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for being here, especially all my good friends, some of which even have class and have been <coughs> for me. Anyway, so thank you. All right, let's get started. So first, I'm going to give you a little bit about me. I went to Falcon Creek Middle School, and now I'm here at Grandview. In terms of the technology classes I took at Grandview, I took programming game design as a sophomore and AP computer science last year. Um, so then also in terms of extracurriculars, I'm involved in marching band, wind ensemble, Federal Patriot, and the like. Um, so really what first <laughs>
advisor you're tipping me, because they are actually a really big part of my project. So first I'm going to talk about my expert advisor, Chad Matheson. He's a systems architect and he does software development for a living. Um, he's an expert in signal processing, which has a lot of overlap with the project that I was trying to do. Um, he has been an invaluable resource throughout this project. He's helped me so much with the direction of where I should be going, code review, just solving problems. So I thank him very much. Um, next, I'm going to talk about my support advisors. Um, so first on the list, I have Andy Starr. And to be honest with you, he should be an expert advisor. He has helped me so much with some of the mathematical formulas I needed. And he even designed in SOLIDWORKS this case for my Raspberry Pi. I'll talk a little bit about why this was so important later, but he did an incredible job with it. Um, and then in terms of the rest of my support advisors, I have Ivan Kruvnov, who is a student here and a friend of mine, to help me out with code review and that kind of thing. And then my mom and dad, and thank for my their continued support throughout my time developing this project. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the project objectives, what I wanted to do when I came into this project. So in terms of research, I wanted to research some computer vision algorithms as well as template matching algorithms because that was what you know, the main premise behind IRS recognition is. Um, I wanted to obtain a greater understanding of the Python programming language because while I didn't deal with it over the summer, um, I didn't have you know, an incredible understanding of it. And I also wanted to learn more about the OpenCV computer vision library because it's, there's so much depth to it that I only scratched the surface during my time at Northrop. Uh, I wanted to discern a strong security model for storing IRS templates, because if this were to be used in some sort of corporate scenario, security is key. Um, I wanted to, to develop, obviously, a working prototype, and I will demo this at the end. And then as an extension, I wanted to interface with an electronic door lock. Obviously, didn't get done. It's not the end of the world, though. It was an extension. It's in the name. Um, you know, that's what I plan to do if I finished everything. And I finished everything, but not time to do that. Not the end of the world. All right, so now we're going to talk about some of the technology that I used for my project. Um, so first we have SSH, which stands for Secure Shell. And I used the client for that, I used this putty. And I'm not going to get too technical, but essentially what this allows me to do is to log in remotely to my microcomputer right here without having to plug it in to a monitor and a keyboard and a mouse and have all that stuff. So it made developing on it much, much easier. Next, I needed an IDE. Now for this, I chose PyCharm. Um, and an IDC stands for Integrated Development Environment, and it's just a sense of where coders write their code in the environment they're working. Um, like I said, it's a tie and so very renowned Python IDE. Um, next, I needed to, uh, for the programming language, I used Python, and I compiled the OpenCV Lab 3.0 library. Um, then in terms of version control, I used Git, and essentially what version control is, is it allows me to keep code uh, history, history revisions of my code and backups of my code. Every good developer should be using it. just makes your code much safer. You know, if your code dies, well, it's backed up somewhere else. Um, and obviously for the hardware, I have the Raspberry Pi 2, the microcomputer I illustrated there, and the Bright Pi, which is the LEDs, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, so now here's a little bit of a roadmap of my project. This is what I came up with. Um, it has all the parts of virus recognition and what I needed to do throughout the year. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this. I'm going to then transition into my timeline, which is kind of based off of this. And then I'll go individually through each of these things and talk about them. So I have the initial research at the beginning of the year. Obviously, I had to do some research. I know I wanted to do this, but I need to learn about it. Um, the case design and 3D print, we needed that. And then the steps of IRS recognition, we have pupil localization. We have iris localization, the iris unwrapping, the template matching and generation based either on pixel intensity or physical features and then some sort of secure storage system. All right, so now I'm going to talk to you about my timeline. I'm going to try and get through this as fast as possible so I can get the good stuff uh, that I have to do this. So the <laughs> timeline for October, when we officially started the project, it was just me finishing up some research about you know, the uniqueness of the iris, um, that kind of stuff, watching for red light. And for November, I did quite a bit in November. I set up my IEDE. Um, I did some research and research regarding unit testing in the context of my project. Um, there's some programming interface with the camera module. Um, I did want to get some test images during this month. Did not happen. I made it up in the later months, though. Don't worry. I also wanted a 3D printing case. Also didn't happen, but that's okay. Um, but I continued on with researching uh, computer vision techniques and programming that uh, for localizing the pupil, the first step of our recognition. Um, in terms of December, I wanted to finish setting up um, or finish coding. Uh, localization of the iris and modularizing that component. Um, I wanted to program the iris, 
well, like I said, and I wanted to set up some of those unit tests. It didn't get to that. Once again, it gets made up. I'm a 3D case, or 3D printing my case, sorry, we finished that then this month. Um, and then I needed to research and start programming techniques to unwrap the iris. Um, in terms of January, I uh, made up that, modularizing that component. I had to restructure some of my code and recode a lot of things due to some of the issues I was having. Um, research more you know, computer vision techniques, edge detection, to make pupil localization more efficient. Um, during this month, I also made up getting test images on a cost nice iris, so I can use examples. And then, oh, whoops, my bad. Um, then re edge detection, and then prepare for my mid year. Um, in terms of February, I worked out a lot with template matching, both with the linear correlation coefficient, um, as well as some Galois filters, being testing those, you know, testing those reliabilities, that kind of thing. And then the one thing I didn't get to in my project was having the step size when I unwrap the IRS be constant. I'll explain what that means later. This probably doesn't make very much sense now. So the only thing I had to cut from my project, but it really didn't have any impact in the end. Um, March, I wanted to draft up a flowchart for the security model because I wanted something very complex and very uh, highly secure, obviously. And I programmed all that and tested those interactions. Uh, finally, in April this month, I've been working on preparing for this final presentation, my board, my demo, all that good stuff. All right, so here's that roadmap again that I showed you. So now we're going to talk about in these next few slides some of the initial research I did coming into this project. Um, so first, I needed to research the uniqueness of the iris. Obviously, it's highly unique because I came into this knowing that it was a field for biometrics, but I didn't exactly know how unique. Um, first, though, what I figured out is color is hereditary, but luckily that has nothing to do with iris recognition. So you can't have you know, similar irises if your um, siblings have the same color as well. Um, rather, it's the texture of that iris that makes it so unique. It starts to form three months in the gestation and finishes by eight months. And all of these tight foldings of membranes and all of this just makes a bunch of very unique physical features in the eye. For some context, the probability of two people having the exact same texture in the iris is 10 to the power of 80. Whereas the estimated number of atoms in the universe, 10 to the power of 78. So it's highly, highly unique. <coughs> so as you can see here, here's just some of those physical features on here that just makes that iris so unique. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the um, iris in near infrared light. And when I came into this project after doing some very preliminary research, I learned that almost all iris recognition processes use near infrared light. But I didn't know why, because obviously it washed out the color of the eye. And you know, I was like, well, how did that come? Um, but there's two reasons for this. One, it makes the blacks much more black in terms of pixel intensity, and I'll detail that in the next slide so you have some context. And two, there's no discomfort with the subject. Since near infrared light, um, you can't see it with the visible eye, you don't see anything. Like if it was you know, a normal, like a flash from a camera, you'd probably be blinded if you put your eye in there. <laughs> um, so here's a picture of what I like to illustrate. On the left, you have an iris that is illuminated by the visible light. And we have a line drawn across, and it uh, grasps the pixel intensity or the pixel values. As you can see, once you hit the pupil, there really isn't much difference. However, over here, with the iris illuminated by near infrared light, once you hit the edge of the pupil, there's clearly a big difference. And this can be used then to determine what the boundaries of that pupil is. Um, so next, I'm going to talk about unit testing. Um, so this is something suggested to me by my advisor, and it was actually very helpful for my project. I'm not going to read that quote to you, but essentially unit testing involves me coding, um, making my code, right? And then I know the input, and I know the output. And then I run that through my code. And if the test passed, and then I get the expected output, it works. But if it doesn't, and the test fails, I know I broke something somewhere, and I can go in and fix it. Whereas if I didn't have this, then I could break something unknowingly for you know a week, not know it, and come back and have everything be broken. So this helps a lot. So here's some code to illustrate this. It's not scary, I promise. On the top, we have a function, it adds two numbers. On the bottom, we have a unit test that tests this function, and it says, is 5 plus 4, 9? And indeed, 5 plus 4 is always going to be 9. The laws of addition aren't changing anytime soon. Um, the example is trivial, but it gets the point across. I have an input, I know what the output is, and I run my code to test it. All right, so now I'm going to talk about the next part of that roadmap, and that's the case design and print. Um, so once again, this was designed by uh, Andy Starr out of the graciousness of his heart. It's a wonderful case. Um, it's actually much more important than you think. Uh, one, for two reasons. One, it allows for a much greater degree of control when you're taking the pictures. 
because before we had this case, literally the camera just like attached by a thread and bouncing up and down everywhere. It was just so hard to take pictures. And two, it allows for a much um, greater degree of control over the ambient light. Because when you're doing temple matching, ambient light actually is a big factor that plays into that. Um, so, like I said, one test print, two failed prints, and two trips to Lowe's later, we have this case, and there's the part graveyard. Alright, so now we're going to talk about uh, the good stuff, the iris recognition part of the project. Um, so the first part of iris recognition is pupil localization. This is arguably the most important part of the project because it serves as a reference point. If you know where the pupil is in an image, then obviously you know that the iris is simply surrounding it. Um, and so, like I said, it's most important because this is a tiered system. So if pupil localization fails, it's not going to be able to find anything else, and it's not going to work. Um, so how does it work? So first we take an input image, and then because those blacks are so black, because I described earlier with that near infrared light, we run binary thresholding on it. This says any pixel value below a certain, above a certain value is black, any one below a certain value is white, or vice versa, or whatever, and you get a binary image like this. As you can see, it does a very good job of finding that pupil. Um, from there, I use OpenCV to write contour scan, and contour is just some sort of irregular shape, and it finds the pupil very well, and then I just do an endpoint scan to find the value for the iris, or the pupil, excuse me. Um, so here, these are all input images I have taken with the camera. This is all of my code running on it. This is all, this is all me. So here's an input image, here's an output image. There it is, perfectly finding that pupil. All right, so I did have some major pitfalls with this. Um, and it had to do with the consistency of it, because like I said, this is the most important part of the project. It serves as that reference point. And if it fails, you know, everything else fails. Um, and because we got the case done a little later than I had intended, I fell into one of the most um, devastating traps that a developer can fall into. When I was coding, I was essentially coding for only one or two test images. And that means when I got new test images because I had the case done, everything just didn't work. So I will show you some of my misfortune there. As you can see, not the people, <laughs> not the people. I, I think you get the point. Um, it didn't work. Um, so I had to go back and rewrite all my code. Good news, I rewrote it I'm using the method I described in the previous slides, and it works much more consistently now. Alright, so now obviously the next step is the iris localization. Once we know where the pupil is, we need to be able to find the iris um, so that we can extract the features from it. Um, my code does all this, so how does this work? So we take the input image and then we blur it so that the, yeah, it's just, it's just a blur on the end. So what that does is that the boundary between the edge of the iris and the white part of your eye, the delta change in pixel intensity should be the highest at that point. Then I can start with blur it, so I have people scan outward until I find that highest change in pixel intensity, and then that's when I can find the iris. Um, so once again, here is the here is the pupil. There it is, finding the iris almost perfectly. It's a little bit on the out, outside, but it's pretty good. Um, so now I'm going to talk about a little bit, just show off a little bit um, some less than ideal scenarios. This is a picture, obviously not a very great picture. But I ran my code on it, and it actually turned out very well. It detected it pretty good. Obviously, template matching isn't going to work on this because so much detail is lost, but it's impressive nonetheless, and I thought I'd show you that. Um, so now I'm going to talk about unwrapping the iris. This isn't um, an essential component, but it's very helpful because it's hard to deal with data when it's in a circular plane, like the iris. So what this does is it takes the iris and it does some simple trig, polar to Cartesian conversion, and it unwraps that circle into a rectangular plane, so the data is much easier to access and manipulate. Um, so here's what I'm talking about. So the x values are cosine theta, the y value, or x values are, yeah, are cosine theta, the y values are sine theta, and I go out one radius, and I go in a circle, is my line segment, I go out the next radius, and I continually do that until I have the entire iris. And what I do is I plop it into a rectangular block right there. Um, then later we'll get rid of this, we'll just cut it in half, because this is the result of the a little bit of um, under the eyelid that got caught in that image. Um, so template generation. So this now is where we start getting to the matching part of the iris recognition process. So once we unwrap the iris, it has all the useful um, detail in it that we want, but we still need to be able to extract that detail or make it more prominent so that we can run matching on it. Um, so first, there's two ways of generating templates. First, we can do it um, based on pixel intensity. Because that stands to reason that if you have two irises with the same ambient light and you unwrap them, <coughs> you lay them on top of each other, when you compare the pixel values at each position, this should be similar. And then secondly, um, so that's, that's the pixel intensity template right there. And then secondly, 
we can also do matching based on those physical features that I mentioned earlier, all those crypts and furrows and the iris that make it so unique. What I do is I can evolve this image with a Gabor filter. I'm not going to explain too much about it, but essentially it brings out those prominent physical features. Um, so here is the um, unwrapped iris. We cut it in half, so we don't have any of that. And then here is the um, image after we equalize the Instagram and we increase contrast. Similarly, here is that image after we pull up with the Gabor filter. And now we have template matching. So like I said earlier, there's two ways we can do that based on pixel intensity or based on physical features. So the first thing um, for pixel intensity uses the linear correlation coefficient, and the second one uses the damage difference. So I'll illustrate both of those now. Um, so for pixel intensity, here's two different templates, and we would lay on, lay on top of each other, and here's the formula. So <laughs> this, this is not easy to help you with. It's actually not as bad as it seems once you kind of understand it. So x is a matrix of pixel values representing one image, and y is a matrix of pixel values representing another image. And this function is bounded from negative one to one, and essentially all it's doing is it's comparing the similarity of those pixel values at every position. Um, so in terms of a match, um, usually a value of 0 0.7 or higher is considered a good match. Like I said, bounded from negative one to one. Uh, next, this is the uh, template for the physical features. And now notice how these templates are binary. Binary meaning it's either black or it's white. So a black could be a zero and a white could be a one. And those are the bits of the image. So what we do with Hamming distance is we calculate the number of disagreeing bits and divide it by the total number of bits. So here's an illustration. We have these are green because they're both one. These are green because they're both zero. Oh, these are disagreeing. So, out of, so three of them are disagreeing out of the 10. So three over 10 point three, that's that Hamming distance. This function is bounded from zero to one. And it's a little bit opposite for the linear growth with a little bit opposite compared to the linear correlation coefficient. But a good match usually results in a value of less than 0 0.4. Uh, so template matching some major pitfalls and I'm going to illustrate with you. This, uh, there's a few things that play in the template matching, some sort of environmental and outside factors that can really throw it off. The first has to do with ambient light. If you take one picture and then you take another one but you let a differing amount of light inside the apparatus right there because it's not a perfect seal, then when you're trying to compare those pixel values, some of them might be whiter or darker, and the match might be thrown off, even though it's the same iris. Um, so I have taken some steps to try and improve that. Um, we have a new top of the case with a rubber seal on the top of it. I didn't want to put it on my case now for fear of messing anything up so close to the final presentation, but I just wanted to show you the development process of the problems and how I'm trying to fix them. Um, the second one has to do with iris rotational areas. Once again, it stands the reason that we unwrap them. If they're both the same, you lay on top of each other, the pixel value should correspond neatly. But if one of the pictures is rotated and you unwrap them, and then you kind of lay them on top of each other, they're going to be shifted in one direction or the other. And this can also throw off the match. Um, I haven't taken very much to try and improve that part, um, but the way you would improve that is you would run multiple matches and just shift over those pixel values in one of the template images to try and get a better result. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the security of my product. And I wanted something, like I said, that could potentially be commercially viable and that was highly secure so that it could be used in a corporate world. So recall earlier in my timeline that I drafted up a flowchart for a security model. And here it is. Now I'm not going to go into detail and explain this because it's highly complex. I did have to code every step of this. But essentially what this does is it establishes a degree of trust with the Raspberry Pi as well as some sort of central server that allows for iris templates to be encrypted and decrypted in a secure fashion. All right, so now we're going to talk about the commercial viability of my product. Like I mentioned previously, I wanted something that could be potentially commercially viable um, in the real world. In its current state, it's not, but it comes very, very close, and I'm going to illustrate a few reasons why. Um, so first, in terms of cost, this apparatus, as well as the case and all, the camera and all of that, costed about $150. And this is much, much better than its competitors. For reference, $1,000, $999. So that's, it kills in the cost of the cost department very well. Um, in terms of software, the software I use is all free and open source. So that means if I did sell this, I wouldn't have to pay any royalties, any companies to use the software or whatever, and that usually wraps up a large cost. Um, where it falls short, however, is speed and consistency. First, the of speed takes about 10 to 15 seconds from taking a picture all the way down to performing a match. Um, this is unfortunate because 
this thing, it's not a very powerful computer, but it, it gets the job done. But um, other commercial projects are probably much faster. You probably don't need to be standing outside in the rain and the snow waiting 10 to 15 seconds for this to try and match your IRC and get in the door. Um, in terms of consistency, it's about 75% depending on who takes the picture. It really is an art trying to get a good picture. That's half the battle, um, trying to get a good picture here. Once again, you don't want to be standing out in the snow and having to take multiple pictures because it didn't work the first time. Um, so with that, I'm going to set up for a live demo. Um, my dad is going to come up and we're going to take two pictures of the design and match them together. So hold tight while we set this up. <laughs> Should come up alone. It's just slow. <laughs> All right, so we are going to take two pictures of my dad's iris, and then if they're good, well, I'll show you all the process going on over here. One disclaimer: all the code is running on this laptop, just so it's much faster for the audience. <coughs> It usually take much slower running on that small computer, but everything else is the same. Um, if I don't make a picture the first time, we'll take a second one, and I think we should be able to get them. Are you ready? All right. Three, two, one, go. It's going to go and take some pictures. Enter, it'll go through it in the match. And 
you look at that, 0.24 is indeed less than 0.4. bibliography is about, oh, 10 slides. So while that's going on, I am going to take any questions that you may have. So let me just pull up the bibliography. All right, any questions you may have? Maybe I would do it again, uh, or maybe on my own time trying to forgo a little bit more. <coughs> probably not again for senior projects. I mean, like the geography is not up here. Did you just, did you just duplicate? Um, no, I mean, did you, you said you're, you're about to duplicate instead of extend? Uh, oh, <coughs> okay. Should be already on. Didn't change it, yeah. um, <laughs> all right, well, pretend there's a bibliography <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, um, first, I have an apology to make. Um, when discussing former students like Sam and Ivan, I usually claim that I taught them 1% of what they know. <laughs> well, I'm going to buy that by like, um, My question, um, since you've gone so far beyond everything that um, I think it just comes from partially because in class we're confined to doing, you know, certain assignments and projects and all this for a grade, but I really wanted to do something that, because I'm passionate about coding obviously, but something that, you know, obviously I could just make my own and not have to be bound by any rules or regulations. And then, like I said, my experience with North Rock, that kind of all inspired me to do that. Yeah, let me just... Okay. Any more questions? Yes. So, uh, I've seen that there's um, some new computers that have come out where it uses a higher track mm -hmm. How did those account for the difference in the and the uh, Like you said, that was an issue. Mm -hmm. Um, well, one, they probably have some sort of improved apparatus there, but if not, they can, when you have virus recognition on some sort of desktop, the desktops are so much more powerful. You can do so much more, you know, calculations and all that stuff. Like I showed up here, like it was almost instantaneous on here, but it would have taken 10, 15 seconds on here. Um, so they can probably negate a lot of that stuff by doing a lot of post-processing on the image, but that really wasn't like, feasible for me with that because of the speed. Um, so if we upgraded to past or hardware, do you think that would rock up the price? Um, I think that the other ones are. Yeah, it probably would bring up the price. Uh, the Raspberry Pi microcomputer was about forty dollars. I could probably get a chip press that was um, specialized for doing the calculations I need, but it would probably get yeah, probably be upwards of yeah, you know, hundred, two hundred dollars. Maybe it would increase the cost, but once again, it's still much lower cost than a lot of those other. Any other questions? Yes. So you said that the probability of two people having the same virus is 10 to the 80. Mm -hmm. But if they have not exactly identical irises, but like slightly different, how would the chances of your matching algorithms work be on that? You know? mm -hmm. uh, I don't know like the uh, complete details on that, but I assume it would be okay because when you convolve that image with the Gower filter and it brings out those physical features. Those physical features are highly unique to each individual person. Sure, some people might have the same, you know, crypts or arrows in the same spot, but there's just so many different features because of all the infolding and all that stuff forming when you're really young that I doubt it would have that big of an effect on it. Yes? How would you apply this in your life? Um, okay, I, I guess I forgot to mention that. Oh, when I came into this project, I wanted this to be used um, like in a corporate scenario. So what you could do is put this maybe on the wall of some sort of building and interface it with an electronic door lock. That's my extension that I never got to. But then instead of having you know a key, uh, key fingerprint scanner or a passcode, which could easily be stolen or your fingerprint lifted, um, you know they'd have to take your eye out. <laughs> <laughs> 
much more secure. Yeah. Oh, one more question. Does having contact lenses matter? You know, people will get colored contact lenses or the ones that look like cat eyes or something. I mean, what if you have that? Does it go through? Um, I haven't actually tested anybody with contact lenses. I assume the color wouldn't make a difference at all. Like I said, color doesn't matter. It has to do with the texture. I assume um, it would change those values a little bit. So I think it would work if you, when you scan your eye, you have the contacts in both times, but maybe not if like you scan it one within, one without. So, yeah. Okay, well, good job. Thank you very much. Sir.